a little introspection will tell you that the first step is not likely to be profitable because if the event age is to occur, if Jane is to lead at every step of the count, then the very first ballot must indeed go to Jane and there's no possibility. Otherwise, Bob will take an early lead. Okay, that doesn't seem very informative. There's no variability possible at all for the first step, for the first ballot, if Jane is to lead at every step. But the last ballot seems to be relatively unconstrained. Who does it go to? Well, there are two possibilities. It could go to Jane, or it could go to Bob. Now, this is suggestive. You see, the last ballot has to go to one of two people. It has to go to Jane or to Bob. We now have a way of partitioning the space using an ancillary event. The event as to what happens to the last ballot. Let us introduce some notation now. Right? And using the notation we've been using throughout this tableau, let A denote this side information, ancillary information about the game. Let A denote the event that Jane acquires the last ballot. The complement of A then, of course, is the event that Bob gets the last ballot. We are now in place to put together some early calculations. Well, let's begin. Let's take a look at the pictures we have developed so far. To begin, we have n plus m ballots, n go to Jane, M go to Bob. If Jane gets the last ballot, then the remaining ballots are N plus M minus 1 in number. And of those ballots, remember, Jane gets the last ballot, Jane now gets N minus 1 and Bob gets M of the first N plus M minus 1 ballots. If, on the other hand, Bob gets the last ballot, then of the first n plus m minus 1 ballots, Jane still has to get n, but Bob now gets m minus 1. This is our picture. Now, let's see how we can milk this. Remember, our target event is h, that Jane leads at every step of the count. This event has got a certain probability under our probability measure, our combinatorial measure. We don't know what it is. We would dearly love to know what it is. Of course, this is the object of the exercise. But whatever it is, it is going to depend on only two parameters. The number of ballots Jane gets, n, and the number of ballots Bob gets, m. In other words, the probability of h is a function of n and m. Let's introduce a little notation here. Let's call this p with subscripts n, m. So we'll call this P of N and M. Keep in mind that P sub N M represents the probability that Jane leads Bob at every step of the count. When she gets N votes, Bob gets M votes. And the notation is valid for any choices of N and M. Now let us see what we can say given this choice of notation for the conditional probability that Jane leads at every step of the count, given that she gets a last ballot. Now, once Jane gets a last ballot, there are n plus m minus 1 ballots remaining. She gets n minus 1 of those. Bob gets m of those. And whatever the arrangement, it has to be the case that the running total over those n plus m minus 1 ballots has to favor Jane at every step. This suggests that all we have done is reduced the size of the problem from n plus m ballots to n plus m minus 1 ballots. From n votes for Jane to n minus 1 votes for Jane. From m votes for Bob to m votes for Bob. And therefore, the conditional probability that Jane leads every step of the way, given that she gets a last ballot, the conditional probability of H given A, is in our notation P of n minus 1, comma, m. Recall, 
P of n minus 1 comma m tells us that in an election where one candidate Jane gets n minus 1 votes, Bob gets m votes, that the candidate Jane leads at every step of the way. That's exactly what is captured now in our conditional probability. What if Bob gets the last vote? In this case, we have n plus m minus 1 ballots, the first n plus m minus 1 ballots. Of these, Jane has to get her full complement of n, and Bob has to get m minus 1, and they have to be arranged in such a way that Jane leads every step of the way. And by our definition, by our notational choice, the conditional probability of H, given the complement of A, that Bob gets the last ballot, is exactly P sub N, comma, M minus 1. A distinction with a difference. Right? Right. This is subtle, so pause and make sure we absorb this. Right? The key idea here is that we're focusing on that last element. What we manage to do is reduce the size of the problem to a smaller problem of the same type. Once we have this in place, we have all the elements needed to put things together into a beautiful formulation. Okay? Of course, we now also need to understand something about the nature of the side information, the ancillary event, based on which we are computing these conditional probabilities. And here's where the artful choice of partition comes to the fore. By looking at that last step, it becomes easy to see what the chance of that last ballot going to one or the other candidate is. Let's begin with Jane. What is the probability that Jane gets the last ballot? Well, this is simple enough. The last ballot now is fixed to be J. That leaves n plus m minus 1 ballots. Of those n plus m minus 1 ballots, m belong to Bob, and the number of ways of arranging m b's and n minus 1 j's in the first n plus m minus 1 ballots is n plus m minus 1 choose m. How many ways are there of arranging m ballots for Bob in totality? Well, there are n plus m ballots, and Bob can be the m ballots for Bob could be in any of m locations. That's n plus m choose m. We take a ratio, simplify the binomial coefficients, and we get n over n plus m. Very simple. We pause and say, is this reasonable? Of course it is. There are n plus m ballots. The chance that a chosen ballot goes to Jane is naturally enough. The proportional number of ballots for Jane out of the total, n over n plus m. What are the chances the last ballot goes to Bob? Well, this is the event, the complement of A. And of course, we could use a similar calculation or simply appeal to additivity and subtract the probability of A from 1. And we find this is, again, very intuitive, very natural, m over m plus m. All the raw materials now are at hand. We've got certain raw probabilities, the probabilities of R side information, our ancillary events. We also have various conditional probabilities, albeit in terms of the still awkward, strange notation that we've created. But let's put this all together and see where we went up. We are interested in the probability of the event H that Jane leads at every step of the count when she gets N ballots and Bob gets M ballots. By additivity, in conjunction with chaining and conditional probabilities, we can write the probability of H by conditioning first on the occurrence of A, that Jane gets the last ballot, and then by conditioning on a complement that Bob gets the last ballot. On your left is the probability that we called P sub N M. It depends, of course, on N and M. On the right, we have a decomposition, which is the first conditional probability of H given A is P of n minus 1 comma m. A has got probability n over n plus m. The second conditional probability, P of H given the complement of A, is P of n comma m minus 1. And then the probability of A complement is m over n plus m. 
This is looking complex, but we've actually made great strides. You see, on the left is the target, an expression in terms of the n and m given to us. On the right is an expression involving fixed ratios involving n and m and terms that depend upon n and m for smaller values of n and m. As a high-level principle, this is very important. We've taken a complex problem and in one step reduced it to an amalgamation of smaller problems. This gives us hope. Now, before we go on and try to solve this, such an expression holds for a certain range of values of m and n. Which range of values? Well, m has to be at least 1 and n has to be larger than m. What we've done is constructed a recurrence with a range of validity. Now, you may have experience with recurrence uh, arguments in inductive arguments. Uh, recurrences arise, for example, things like binomial coefficients and a variety of other settings. Uh, a familiar uh, important one is that of the Fibonacci sequence. But in general, to solve a recurrence of this nature, one needs boundary conditions. And so what happens at boundary values for n and m? And these are easy to intuit. What can we say about P of n and m, for example, when m is bigger than n? Well, naturally, if m is as big as n or larger, then the chance that Jane will lead at every step of the way is zero, because sooner or later, Bob will catch up to Jane's count. What if m is zero? What if Bob, the poor unfortunate Bob, gets no votes? then as long as Jane gets any votes, then she will take a lead and she will never relinquish it. The chance is certain. This gives us boundary conditions. Now together, a recurrence with a range of validity and boundary conditions give us all the tools needed to solve the problem. At this point, we have exhausted all the chance-driven elements for the problem. We are now left with a calculus problem, a question of solving for a doubly indexed sequence, satisfying a certain recursive definition with certain boundary conditions. But of course, no, we don't want to leave it at this point. Right? We do want to carry it through to see what the answer is and see whether it comports with intuition. So let's spend a slide on building up a solution for this problem.